I'm going to talk mostly about the United States, uh, in part because I know it better, uh, but also in part because of its uh, unique significance in the global system. That's uh, been true uh, dramatically since the Second World War. The, the character and extent of this uniqueness uh, often isn't understood and uh, would be easily worth a talk in itself, but I won't go into that. However, we constantly see that uh, even in uh, uh, relatively small ways. So, for example, when uh, a housing bubble in the United States burst a couple of years ago, uh, that initiated a global uh, economic crisis, which uh, most of the world is still mired in. Uh, the uh, worst outcomes were just uh, averted by quite desperate measures. Uh, in another domain, when uh, France and Britain uh, wanted to bomb Libya a couple of weeks ago, uh, they had to turn to a more uh, reluctant uh, Washington to do the heavy lifting and provide the uh, vast bulk of the means of violence. The uh, U.S. has a huge uh, comparative advantage in that domain. Uh, furthermore, although uh, the United States uh, U.S. society and its uh, political economy uh, are unusual in some respects. Uh, it's not that different from elsewhere. Uh, the, uh, and in fact, the uh, developments within the United States over the years have often foreshadowed what is uh, uh, going to happen pretty soon in uh, other uh, uh, industrial societies of the state capitalist world. Uh, well, the, that world, in fact, the whole world, is, of course, always changing, uh, but there are significant continuities, and they're worth bearing in mind. Uh, one continuity is that those who uh, uh, control the economic life of a country uh, also tend to have overwhelming influence uh, over state policy. And that should be a truism taught in elementary school that was... Uh, formed succinctly by Adam Smith in words that I've quoted before but are important enough to repeat. Uh, he, speaking of Britain, of course, he wrote that the principal architects of policy uh, are the owners of the society, in his day the merchants and manufacturers, the masters of mankind, as he called them, and they ensure that state policy serves their interest however grievous the effect on others, including the domestic population, but primarily the victims of what he called their savage injustice abroad. And India was his prime example. Uh, that was an early in the days of the destruction of India. Uh, well, today the uh, masters of mankind are uh, uh, multinational corporations and financial institutions but the lesson still applies, and it helps explain why the state corporate complex is indeed a threat to freedom and, in fact, even survival. Well, by now there are uh, important uh, elaborations of Smith's truism applied to the modern world. Uh, the most uh, significant and sophisticated version that I know is by uh, political economist uh, Thomas Ferguson, what he calls his investment theory of politics, which in brief uh, and simplified essentially views U.S. elections as uh, occasions in which uh, coalitions of private investors uh, coalesce uh, to invest to control the state. It turns out to be a thesis of quite high predictive success over more than a century, as he shows. Uh, what it means, in effect, is that uh, elections are pretty much bought and that the buyers expect to be rewarded. And that happens all the time. It was illustrated very clearly in the uh, last U.S. presidential election in 2008. Uh, President Obama's victory uh, traces largely to a, a huge uh, influx of capital from the financial institutions especially toward the end of the campaign. They prefer, preferred him to his uh, opponent, uh, McCain, and they expected to be rewarded. And, of course, they were. 
Uh, the country at that time was mired in a deep recession, uh, so Obama's first act was to select an economic team. It was drawn almost entirely from those who had caused the severe economic crisis that he inherited. He systematically avoided uh, critics of their practices, including quite prestigious ones, Nobel laureates. Uh, actually, the business press uh, wrote rather ironically about this. Uh, Bloomberg News did a review of Obama's economic team, went through each one of them, uh, looked at their records, and said, concluded that uh, these people shouldn't be uh, on the economic team to fix up the economy. They should be getting subpoenas, which was pretty correct. They didn't, of course. Well, not surprisingly, the team chose measures which rewarded the major culprits who are now uh, richer and more powerful than before and uh, poised to lead the way to the next and uh, probably more severe financial crisis. Now, there was recently an interesting article about this by uh, the special inspector of the bailout programs, Neil Borofsky. Uh, he wrote a bitter condemnation of the way it was executed. Uh, he points out that the legislative act that authorized the bailout was a bargain. Uh, the financial institutions that were responsible for the crisis uh, would be saved by the taxpayer and the victims of their misdeeds, in fact real crimes, the victims would be somewhat compensated by measures to protect uh, home values and preserve uh, home ownership. It was mostly a housing crisis. Well, only the first part of the bargain was kept. The financial institutions were rewarded uh, lavishly for causing the crisis, and they were forgiven for outright crimes, but the rest of the program uh, floundered. Uh, as Borofsky points out, I'm quoting him, uh, foreclosures continue to mount uh, with eight to 13 million filings forecast over the program's lifetime. While the biggest banks are 20% larger than they were before the crisis and control a larger part of the economy than ever, they reasonably assume that the government will rescue them again if necessary. Indeed, credit rating agencies, uh, credit rating uh, agencies incorporate future gov uh, government market uh, bailouts into their assessments of the largest bank that means exaggerating market distortions that provide them with an unfair advantage uh, over smaller institutions which continue to struggle. So in short, as he puts it, Obama's programs were a giveaway to Wall Street executives and a blow in the solar plexus to their defenseless victims. In other words, the government uh, listened uh, to those who have a voice in the political system and acted accordingly, all completely in accord with uh, Smith's truism. Well, there should be no surprises here. There are uh, careful studies of Senate votes over a long period, and they show that the Senate is indeed responsive to a sector of the population, uh, the top third in income. Actually, a closer analysis would show that it's a very small fraction of that uh, top third. In contrast, there's no correlation at all uh, between Senate votes and opinions of the middle third. Uh, for the bottom third, uh, there is a correlation. It's negative. Uh, Senate votes are counter to preferences for the bottom third. And on major issues of foreign and domestic policy, there's quite a sharp disconnect between public opinion and public policy. Uh, over a long period. Well, one might argue that these results don't really depart very far from the intentions of the founders of the society. So James Madison, who was the main framer of the constitutional order, uh, he explained to the Constitutional Convention that uh, power should remain in the hands of the Senate the Senate was not chosen directly by voters until about a century ago. Uh, 
in those days, uh, the executive was pretty much an administrator, not an emperor. And the house, third part of the system, which is closer to the public, had much more limited authority. And that's the way, in fact, it was set up. Uh, as Mott Madison explained to the Constitutional Convention, the Senate represents the wealth of the nation, the more capable set of men, men who have respect for property owners and their rights, and understand that government must protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. That's quite accurate, something else that ought to be taught in elementary school. Uh, we should uh, bear in mind, however, in kind of in Madison's defense, that his mentality was pre-capitalist. So he assumed that a senator would be, as he put it, an enlightened statesman and benevolent philosopher. Uh, the Senate would be a chosen body of citizens whose wisdom may best discern the true interests of their country and whose patriotism and love of justice will be least likely to sacrifice it to temporary or partial considerations. Uh, they would just they would uh, therefore refine and enlarge the public views, guarding the public against the mischiefs of democratic majorities. This is all rather like the uh, noble uh, Roman gentleman of the fantasies of the day. Actually, Adam Smith before him had a sharper eye. Uh, well, it didn't take long for Madison to uh, uh, shift his thinking about this as he viewed the early results of the democratic experiment, he had second thoughts. In fact, by 1792, just a couple of years later, by then he deplored what he called the daring depravity of the times as the stock jobbers become the Praetorian band of the government, at once its tool and its tyrant, bribed by its largesses and overawing it by clamors and combinations, which isn't a bad description of uh, today's political system and its uh, social and economic correlates. Well, today, in the richest country in human history, 20% uh, of the population qualify for food stamps. The real unemployment today is at the level of the Great Depression for much of the population, manufacturing workers, for example, uh, and in fact, their actual circumstances are much worse than in the Great Depression, which I'm old enough to remember. Uh, most of my family were unemployed working class, and the country was, of course, far poorer than it is today. But it was a hopeful period in many ways. There was a sense that uh, people were doing something about it, and that times would get better. And indeed, they did. Uh, thanks to act very active organizing, CIO, other things, and then an immense uh, government stimulus, first during the war, and then continuing through the post-war decades. Well, that's not true today. The jobs that are being lost are unlikely to return, at least under the current programs of the masters of mankind. Not graven in stone, but that's their programs. Well, while the population suffers, uh, Goldman Sachs, which is one of the main architects of the current crisis, uh, they're now richer than ever, and they have just quietly announced uh, $17.5 billion in extra compensation for last year, with the CEO, Lloyd Blankfein, uh, getting $12.6 million, uh, while his base salary more than triples. And exactly as Borofsky said, they're poised to play the same game again. Uh, why not? They can rely on the government insurance policy uh, that enables them to safely engage in uh, risky transactions, make huge profits, and uh, they don't take into account what in the jargon of economics are called externalities the effect of a transaction on others, uh, crucially in their case what's called systemic risk, that is the likelihood that the whole system will collapse as a result, a result of their risky and hence profitable transactions. 
And when it does collapse, as is anticipated, it's not a big problem. Uh, they can run to the powerful uh, nanny state that they nurtured, uh, clutching in their hands their copies of uh, Hayek and Milton Friedman and Ayn Rand and so on, and they can demand the bailout. Uh, to which they're entitled because they are uh, uh, too big to fail, as it's put. And as one commentator uh, added, uh, Riley also too big to jail for quite serious crimes. Uh, it's a pretty impressive scam. Of course, it's in radical violation of capitalist principles, but the masters of mankind uh, believe in those principles only for others, uh, not for themselves. And that stance has a long pedigree. That's another matter that's important to understand if we want to grasp the nature of the world in which we live. Actually, it lies in the background of a very revealing interaction that's taking place right now between two countries that are quite different in terms of independence and economic development, the United States and Egypt. The democracy uprisings in the Arab world, particularly in Egypt, these are events of truly historic importance, and they're very frightening to Western power for very simple reasons. The West is certainly going to do whatever it can to prevent authentic democracy in the Arab world. To see why, it's enough to take a look at the studies of Arab public opinion which is certainly known to planners, even though not to the Western public, at least to those who keep to the media. Uh, what they show is that, for example, in Egypt, uh, the, uh, uh, about 90% of the population think that the United States is the main threat uh, that they face. Uh, uh, maybe 10% think Iran that is a threat. Actually, about 80% think the region would be more secure if Iran had nuclear weapons. Uh, and the, those figures happen to be high in Egypt, but they're pretty much true across the Arab world. So it's obvious that the West is not is going to do whatever it can to prevent uh, those opinions from entering into policy, which means to prevent uh, any form of uh, authentic uh, uh, democracy. Uh, well, uh, the, uh, uh, the, these are extremely important events, and it's important to take a look at how they're developing. And so the first, uh, the, all of these have long histories, incidentally. So, for example, the Egyptian movement, you probably saw, was uh, led by a group of young uh, tech-savvy uh, uh, people who called themselves the April 6th movement. Uh, why April 6th? Well, that's a reference to a major uh, 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 labor action that was prepared, planned on April 6th, 2008, at uh, one of the major industrial uh, installations in Egypt, the Mahala textile uh, installation. There was supposed to be a big strike, a lot of support activities. I was crushed by the uh, military dictatorship that we were supporting. Uh, forgotten here, you know, who cares, but not forgotten there. And the same is true in the other countries. The things that have been, uh, that have suddenly burst forth are not coming from nowhere. Uh, that's true of the first one, too, which doesn't even get reported. Uh, the current wave uh, of uprisings actually began in uh, the last uh, uh, African colony, uh, one of the two countries of the Arab world that is... Uh, was invaded, uh, occupied, and settled by an outside power, that's Western Sahara, uh, technically a UN dependency, supposed to move on to decolonization. It was invaded in 1975 by Morocco, uh, brutal invasion like most, uh, settled a lot of the Moroccan population there, illegally of course, and there have been repeated protests, there was another one in November, an effort last November, an effort to set up a tent city. Uh, Moroccan forces quickly crushed it. Uh, since it's a UN responsibility, the issue did come to the Security Council, uh, but France made sure that there would be no inquiry into what happened. It has to protect its uh, Moroccan client. 
Uh, that was the first. Uh, the other occupied country, as you know, uh, nothing. So far, the lid has been on tightly. That's uh, Palestine. Uh, plenty to say about that, but I think most of you are uh, familiar with it, or should be at least, uh, not least, from the very courageous and important work done right here by the late Jim Graff. Well, whatever is going to happen, it's not 